We're going to get started in about two minutes, folks. I want to thank everybody who showed up earlier on time. We're going to get started in about one minute, uh, but thank you for joining us for this um, introduction to Decentralized Identity Seminar. Um, I am going to post in the chat uh, some relevant links. We are going to record this. It's being recorded right now, and we are going to post that to the Hyperledger YouTube, and I'll make sure that Morgan State gets a copy of the video as well. Um, and Scott, if you can send me a PDF of your deck, I will uh, share that with Morgan State and put it on the the Discord if folks want to review it after the fact. Absolutely. And if I could ask everybody, if you do have questions, please uh, either put them, please put them in the chat um, and I will uh, go through the questions with Scott after he's done with his presentation. And we're going to get started in one more minute, give folks a chance to settle down. Settle in. All right, everybody, uh, let's kick it off. Thank you everyone for joining us for today's Introduction to Decentralized Identity Seminar. Um, as with all Linux Foundation meetings, this is held on the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy, um, as well as the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Um, and I have links to the Hyperledger Code of Conduct in the chat, as well as links to things like Indicio, who's the Hyperledger member who's giving this presentation, um, along with places like the Hyperledger GitHub, the Hyperledger Wiki. Um, and I will let Tanisha kick it off, and then I'll introduce you to Hyperledger, and then we'll get right to uh, Scott and his presentation. Tanisha. Thank you, Sean. Um, welcome, Hyperledger community and the HBCU network of the National FinSec Center. I um, want to give a special thank you to Sean Bohan, um, David Boswell, Rod Jones for collaborating with the National FinTech Center on this decentralized identity webinar. Um, special thank you to the NDCO team for putting this together and presenting for us today. Um, this is going to be a great webinar for everyone to learn. So thank you again. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Tanisha. Uh, my name is Sean Bohan. I am a community architect at the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, Hyperledger is part of the Linux Foundation. We are an organization, an open source, I'm sorry, we're an organization dedicated to enterprise open source blockchain. Um, we host a number of open source blockchain projects like Hyperledger Fabric, Hyperledger Indy, Hyperledger Aries. Um, Indian Aries are very related to identity. Also things like uh, Bezu, Hyperledger, Sawtooth, and a number of other projects. Um, our work is in the enterprise software space. So, you know, the, the kinds of use cases that Hyperledger projects apply to um, include supply chain and what we're talking about today with identity, um, enterprise resource management, lots of different use cases that can use blockchain. Um, we do not really deal with NFTs or, uh, or uh, cryptocurrencies. We're, we're more on the side of 
projects and programs like central bank backed digital currencies. Um, so that being said, Hyperledger as an organization uh, has a mentorship program. The link is in the chat. I'm going to repost it in about three or four minutes for those who joined late. Um, our mentorship program gives folks an opportunity. It's it's kind of like an internship where the mentor where the mentee proposes a project, um, and if that project is accepted, they're paired up with a uh, maintainer or a a senior contributor at Hyperledger who works with them to bring that project to life. Um, we're pretty excited about it. The application deadline is March 15th, so um, that link will be in the chat. Uh, I would like to introduce Scott Harris from Indicio. Indicio is a member of Hyperledger, and they are really awesome members. They do incredible work in the identity space. I've worked with a lot of folks at Indicio even before I worked at Hyperledger. Um, they're an absolutely great team. And uh, this is this is part of a seminar series we're going to be doing with Morgan State. Uh, this week is what is decentralized identity. This is an intro to the topic. Uh, next week is going to be same time, same place. Um, the technical underpinnings of de decentralized identity, not really a hands-on, but really uh, talking about the technology itself. And Scott's going to give his presentation. Um, and after that, we're going to do Q&A. So if you do have questions, by all means, put it in the chat or in the Discord. Um, we've set up a special channel in the Hyperledger Discord just for Morgan State seminars. So if folks want to join our Discord, the link is in chat, and they can go there and they can ask questions there as well. And also, they can check out the other projects that we have. And with that, I'm going to, st I stopped sharing, Scott's sharing, and I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate the, the time and the invitation. Uh, just a quick confirmation that, that you're seeing uh, the slide on the screen there before I move forward. Looking good. Excellent. Um, my name is Scott Harris. I'm Vice President of Operations at Indicio, and uh, I fill a lot of roles, as most operations folks do. One of them is um, some of these educational uh, activities to um, work with our clients and prospective clients and, and others in the space to um, bring a shared understanding to the uh, decentralized identity technology, the business value of decentralized identity, and um, and to work out some use cases. So I spend quite a bit of time with our clients, uh, along with Sam, who you'll hear from next week, um, looking at um, where this, this unique technology applies and how it can very quickly bring value to um, different verticals and, and different organizations. And we have uh, clients everywhere from, from large enterprise to, um, to some very small businesses. And so there, there are ways to apply this in many, many many, many use cases. Today's talk is, uh, again, about gaining a shared understanding of sort of where we came from and, and why we're here, why this uh, stuff needs to exist, and and then a little bit about how we execute this stuff, this uh, decentralized uh, identity magic, so that it can bring some business value and um, and we can drive adoption. And uh, we certainly thank Hyperledger for all of their support and um and everything they've done to uh, to enable this, because it is a, a sort of game changer in the way we share data um, amongst each other. And um, and with that, uh, off we go. So, uh, being that we probably have a very wide audience, we'll start very very simple here with a slide that indicates the the problem as a whole. The internet was created without a way of identifying people on the other end of the line. So who's using it? And anonymity is a uh, two-sided coin. There are tons of places where you want to be anonymous and you want to protect your privacy. And so anonymity maybe is not the right word, but privacy protection is the right word. And so uh, to be able to enable um, someone to positively identify themselves and prove who they are um, while still protecting their privacy um, is a value prop here. And that's what we're after, um, because when we don't understand who's on the other end of the line or what that data is um, and where it's coming from, uh, we have some problems with trust. And that's really what decentralized identity is about. It's about trust. Um, if you have a LinkedIn account or, or any other type of social media account, I typically ask, well, what did you do to obtain that, uh, that account? And for the most people, you just typed in an email address and then they send an email to that email address. And really all that proved is that you had control of that email address. And from then on, you can sort of pretend to be whoever you'd like to be. 
in the world. And our CEO, Heather Dahl, who's also uh, uh, on the Hyperledger board, I believe now, um, likes to say there were no fewer than six of her on LinkedIn, all using her same profile picture. So there's a problem with uh, the ability to identify people on the other end of the line. And you've all experienced this in your daily life with 2FA and 3FA, and let's text your phone and give you these codes and all these sorts of things. <clears throat> and those are all efforts to uh, put trust in any given interaction or any given relationship. This technology has the ability to remove the need for all that and, and put trust back into things. Uh, but to go even one step further back into our title here, Decentralized Identity, um, we can ask the question, what is identity as it relates to this technology? Uh, typically, you would think of identity as this, this type of thing, the stuff on your driver's license, right? Um, and when I ask anyone sort of off the street or in these trainings to define identity, these are the typical answers that we get. Biographic data, demographic data, your name, date of birth, the things that are on um, government documents or that sort of thing. And that's uh, absolutely and entirely true. However, and here's the big however, um, identity is more than that when we talk decentralized identity. We'll talk often about how we identify individuals, how we know who's on the other end of the, the digital transaction, uh, but it's not really about that. Um, these are only data points. So let's start looking at, uh, at identity in the driver's license sense as simply a collection of data points that refer to a particular data subject. Identity can come from anywhere. It doesn't have to be a government document. So you generate data points by virtue of your existence and your relationship with various entities, an employer or your university, um, social media, governments, um, anywhere you purchase something from, there's a set of data points that is generated uh, as a result of that relationship and various transactions. Any of those data points can then be valuable to someone down the line or be valuable for you to prove something about yourself, maybe not about yourself in the biographic and demographic sense, but maybe you want to prove that you actually did purchase an item uh, in order to get a refund or to, to, um, to move forward in some sort of business transaction. So identity is a collection of data points. And going back to trust, we need to be able to trust those data points in order to move someone through a business type workflow. So we typically refer to identity, not with the lowercase i, but a, a capital I, what we sort of call the everything identity. And it's uh, in this Venn diagram, um, anything is potentially identity. And this is where uh, I'm going to ask everyone to sort of reframe their definition of the word from uh, the things on your driver's license or the things on your passport to any given data point that could be found valuable by someone who would like to um, receive it and understand that it's true. So the takeaway from this presentation, one of the, the many that I'm gonna ask you to take away is that identity is everything. And this technology is about proving um, those data points that we refer to as identity. Um, so in that sense, Humans have identity, as we've just discussed, but so do businesses, so do governments, so do corporate entities, enterprises, small businesses. Um, if you're a small business and operating a, um, a gas station, you've got a ton of data that you generate by virtue of your operations. And all of those data points could be useful to somewhere else. And as we go through this, think about some use cases where this might be applicable. And we have uh, clients that are looking to, to take um, agricultural entities and allow them to prove ownership of land and allow them to prove um, about the, the volume of, uh, of crops that they, that they harvest and then sell down line in order to get government tax credits. All those sorts of things are identity for that, for that entity. Likewise, um, inanimate objects, IoT devices, automobiles, wow. anything like that can be part of an identity. So uh, again, in reframing the way we think, um, decentralized identity is not about people entirely. It's, that's a large part of the use case that we develop, but there are tons and tons of use cases out there that point to uh, other types of identity, the larger pieces. So we've sort of deconstructed identity as a word and a title, and we can deconstruct uh, decentralization here um, for just a minute. Um, decentralization is really about breaking apart some connections 
that uh, that exist right now in the world. And I'll talk about that shortly. Um, but when things are centralized and uh, very complicated or large systems talk to each other in order to share data, um, we have a lot of risk with that. We carry um, a huge amount of cybersecurity risk when it, systems have to talk to each other, right? All of the big breaches and hacks that you've always heard about um, are rarely a case of someone hacking into the, the place where they got the data. They've hacked into somewhere three or four or five or six degrees uh, down the line and eventually got there to, to, uh, to get that data. Likewise, um, when things are centralized and tied together, um, any given entity that goes down or offline it takes everything with it. And maybe you remember it was about a year ago or so that Facebook went offline and then Instagram went offline and anything you logged into with Facebook went offline. So, so all of those things are, are centralization problems. So our goal is to sort of break up those connections and alleviate some of those problems. From a personal data point of view, centralization has a problem of consent and tracking and compliance and transparency or I guess it's a set of problems, right? Um, <clears throat> if you have a digital driver's license in the traditional sense, and you go to buy an age-restricted item at the grocery store with that driver's license, and the grocery store calls back to the, the DMV to check whether it's real, we've got a centralization problem because now the government knows every time you go to buy that age-restricted item. So um, there's a way to, to solve that and decentralized identity does it. Um, but uh, the, the way we solve that is by trying to create a digital model of the analog world, and that's really the goal of decentralized identity. So a bit of a history lesson. Let's go back and look at um, the analog world, 3200 BC, give or take, to around 1964. And here's, here would be one of my quiz questions, Sean, is what happened on or about 3200 BC? And that's the first uh, generally the first record of written things in a clay tablet, right? So somebody started writing something down. And until then, we had um, things that we carried around with us in order to prove things about ourselves. And we had all sorts of trust marks in those sorts of things. We had notary stamps and seals and registered mail, laminations, holograms, all that sort of stuff. And it worked well from a trust point of view, because if someone needed something from me, they asked for it, and I took it out of my pocket and gave it to them. And they could look at it and handle it and decide whether it's trustworthy. And so we didn't have a ton of problems. Uh oh, did somebody Hang on start? A second, Scott. Uh, All right, yeah, Scott, you should be you should be good to go. Uh, let's see what happens here. Let me go back to. It. All right, are we back on my slide there? We're back on your slide. Super. Okay. Um, Let's see, I was talking trust. Uh, Kai is requesting remote control of my screen. No. We're gonna pass on that, Kai. Um, Kai is again requesting remote control of my screen. Um, so, so it was very trustworthy. Someone could handle something and decide whether it's real. However, really inefficient, right? Every time someone wants something, I've got to get it out of my pocket, out of my file cabinet, and I've got to go hand it over to them, drive it into a location, something like that. It's great for protecting privacy. I have complete and clear transparency about what I'm giving and to, who I'm, to whom I'm giving it. We move a little bit long, uh, long a little further to 1964, and here's quiz question number two: What happened around 1964, give or take? That's the incidence or, or the uh, the date of the first fax being sent, and maybe telegraph is a better better way to go. But let's say fax and take the root of that word facsimile and understand that we're not taking something that is real, like a passport or a birth certificate. Let's say to to send to your employer, and you're digitizing it and giving an output on the other end that is a facsimile. It's not the real thing. And yet that employer receiving your birth certificate on the other end treats it as, as if it's real. And in 1964, it wasn't that big a deal. We could kind of trust that because the technology didn't exist to do any fakery with it. Maybe you could use whiteout or an eraser or something like that, but it, but it didn't happen much. However, in our hybrid world up to about 2020, um, a lot of digital tools came along that could uh, that could change those documents. And so instead of maybe faxing, now we're taking a photo of something or we're sending a PDF of my tax return to the mortgage company. And all of those things are prone to fraud and error. And when they're prone to fraud, they're prone to losses for businesses. Uh, 
So we're taking things that are real and pretending that they're real. And when we do so, we assume a lot of risk in pretending that something is real. The decentralized world has the ability to um, take all three of these factors, trust, efficiency, and privacy, and maximize them. So we can get maximum trust using some of the uh, hyperledger uh, tools and, and services that we have built on top of that. We can make things very, very efficient, and we can make things private and gain consent by decentralizing things. So that's our goal here. And when we talk about receiving something that is real uh, and, and or is not real and treating, treating it as if it is, we begin to trust the data. And the reality is most data that businesses and governments and educational entities receive is trustworthy. People aren't doing um, fraud in large percentages. However, that small percentage of untrustworthy data is very, very costly. So if you're looking at uh, use cases that we deal with at our company in FinTech, in uh, travel, in um, healthcare, a little bit of fraudulent or error data or untrustworthy data costs a ton of money. Why does it cost? Well, we have to make a choice as a business when we receive that data of doing one of two things. We either dig deep and we analyze it and we decide whether it's real and we build expensive integrations with the DMV to check your driver's license or we um, we do a lot of work with AI to decide whether a document's real and um, we do liveness check on document PDF photos and, and all sorts of things. It's all very costly, right? Or we say, we don't want to spend all of that money on analyzing that stuff. We're just going to assume the risk and take the and trust that it is real. And when you do that, inevitably, there are some losses associated with that. So when we try to talk about business value and why decentralized identity needs to exist, from our customer's point of view and from the enterprise world's point of view, this is it. This is taking... Uh, data, any given data point, and removing all of those costs associated with the percentage that's untrustworthy. And in financial services, this is numbers in the billions globally, annually, billions of dollars of risk cost and analysis costs for data. And we can remove all of that cost for them and all of those losses. Um, <clears throat> you have to ask the question when you receive an email or a scan or an upload of some document, let's suppose I'm providing um, a tax return and a W-2 to a mortgage company where I'm applying for a mortgage. They've got to do all of that work, analysis work or risk assumption work to say, how do I know it's real? How do I know it hasn't been altered? How do I know you didn't give it to your, your kid in Adobe to go create a fake tax return, right? And I know we all experienced this in the last few years with um, COVID tests and COVID results and all that sort of stuff, right? Where people are just creating their own. And, and uh, every time something is created on its own like that, there's a massive cost to individual businesses, individual governments, and, and to society as a whole. And that's what we're aiming to solve for. So let's ask the question, what is trust in data? Trust amounts to two and a half things or three things. But first, it's about authenticity. So for a given data point that's received, whether it's in a spreadsheet or on a PDF or anything else, can we identify that that data came from the place it claims to have come from? So did that COVID test or that COVID vaccination card come from the health department or did it come from Scott's basement health department, right? Um, that's a very important distinction if you're going to allow somebody into some venue that has uh, restrictions. Um, if you're going to rent someone a car, did that uh, driver's license that you've asked them to upload um, come from the state of Maryland DMV or did it come from Scott's basement driver's license PDF generator, right? These are important points. Authenticity. The second point is data integrity. Is the data real? In other words, has it been altered? Has it been tampered with? And we talk about something uh, as we work in the travel industry at, at DCO, something that, that um, is a big push from TSA and Homeland Security, which is um, digital driver's license at TSA. So if I hand you a, a driver's license as a TSA agent, uh, a regular physical one, and it's somewhat delaminated, they have some ability to decide whether it might have been altered as they receive it, but a, a photo of a driver's license is a very different thing, right? It's very easy to alter those things and very hard when you're trying to process things efficiently and at scale like 
pushing people through TSA checkpoints for any given agent to look at a PDF or look at a JPEG and decide whether it's been altered. So we have to have a way to take those digital credentials and make them trustworthy. So, and this is how we do it. We prove their authenticity and we prove their integrity. We do that using the tools with hyper, that are associated with Hyperledger, uh, ND and uh, Ares and URSA and, and those things that we'll talk about a little bit later. The third piece of trust in data is about usefulness. So once you receive it, you can decide whether or not it's trustworthy, but is it actually useful to you? Um, once you've proven it's authentic and prove it, it has integrity, um, you need to make the business decision of whether or not it's useful. So um, could Starbucks, for example, issue a digital driver's license? Sure. Would you give would you give someone car keys based on that Starbucks driver's license? Well, no, because you don't know what they did before they issued it. But if the DMV of Maryland gave you a driver's license, you've got a pretty good idea as the car rental agency, what the state of Maryland did before they handed that to you. They gave you some tests, right? So usefulness is the other piece of trust. And when we talk about usefulness, we talk about whether data is trustworthy or untrustworthy, and it's actually useful in either case because useful uh, or the, the decision about trust or lack of trust provides an is instant efficiency if it's trusted. It provides an instant risk reduction if the data point is not trusted. So, so moving backwards for just a second, we prove that a given data point is authentic and has integrity. And if it has both of those things and is useful, we get instant business efficiency, no more integrations, uh, no more work to check whether it's real no more risk assumption. Um, if it comes from an untrusted source, we get instant risk reduction because we can kick that data right out of our system and move things along. If you're a mortgage agency and you realize that the W-2 and the tax return uh, didn't come from the employer in the IRS because it's not authentic, you can move that person right out of your mortgage system and, and, and find some remediation to whatever business process you're trying to, trying to move them through. But um, quickly and instantly identifying that is what decentralized identity gives us the ability to do. So just a moment here on governance. And that's a, this is, I do an entire hour and a half on governance and I'm gonna give you about three minute summary. But governance is about the decision-making um, for these data points. And the trust model involves two halves. It involves um, the cryptographic trust. That's the stuff you'll hear about next week and, and a little bit with me today about how we actually execute the proof of authenticity and the proof of integrity using Hyperledger ND and the associated tools that we've created um, on top of it. And it's about really just knowing that knowing the tech and knowing that it works the way it claims to work, right? The other piece of governance is philosophical trust, the human trust hey, I'll give you the keys to the car because your driver's license is from a real state and a real DMV versus Scott's basement DMV that gave you a driver's license. Okay, so those are those are things that are already in place. If I walked in with a paper driver's license to, to Hertz to rent a car, they wouldn't give me the keys. And we need to just give Hertz the ability to look at the digital driver's license, the digital credential and say, awesome, this is real. And here's the keys to your car, off you go. Um, which brings us to decision-making, right? This is what we're talking about, decision-making on data. And decentralization gives each participant autonomy and control. It doesn't cede control to any central organization. We don't have to trust someone to trust someone to trust someone. It's about direct relationships peer-to-peer -peer between entities or between a person and an entity. And this is really, really key to privacy protection, like we talked about in the beginning. And data rights and human rights. And we live in a country here where, where the US is quite a bit behind the rest of the world when it comes to protecting individual data rights and, and the way data is used um, outside of your control. If you live in, in other parts of the world, there are much better protections in place to help you manage your digital life. So decentralized identity or the, the decentralized part of it um, helps you maintain control of your data and it helps each entity that's either giving you data or taking data from you have a full understanding of, of what decisions they're making based on it. So when we go to some of the business use cases here, um, we can gain efficiency and trust without all of that expense, without integrations, without centralizations, um, without all of that uh, analysis cost of data, and without all the risk 
cost of just trusting things uh, to be real, even though they may or may not be. So in the case of something like a digital travel credential, where, which is essentially a credentialized version of a passport using uh, the ledger stuff that I'll talk about shortly, we can present that travel credential to a border control agency to cross a border actually before you fly. And instead of what we do now, taking a photo of your passport, giving it to the airline, and then giving it to the border control agency, and then you still having to stop and take your passport out, right? Because it's all just a JPEG or a PDF. Now we have a digitized version of this credential uh, that can prove itself to be authentic and prove itself to have integrity. And now the border control agency can just let you walk off the plane and walk right down to the beach in the country. Uh, of course, the airlines like that because once we have trust in the system and trust in a credential, they can just let you get right on the plane without a boarding pass. Um, a bank can say, well, hey, if the border control agency trusts this, it's good enough for us to fulfill our KYC and AML requirements for background checks and identification of individuals, come up in an account instantly with this travel credential. And the car rental agency can say, we know you're over 25, so here's the key to your car. And the hotel can say, I don't need to make a copy of your passport now, just share this digital credential and we have instant efficiency. So um, a single trusted credential can provide business value to uh, any number of organizations. So as you begin to think about use cases and how we apply this, which is the, really the focus of my job in Adiso is applying these use cases, we, we start to see that uh, a single trustworthy um, digital credential based on decentralized identity can, uh, can bring instant efficiency and instantly actionable data to all sorts of organizations. So how do we do all this stuff? Well, um, we start to identify first the participants in any given data exchange. And we start with something we call the trust triangle or just a simple workflow. Uh, of issuers. So an issuer will take some data points that they have, right, from that big Venn diagram of, of data points that I showed you at the beginning and say, um, here's some data that we'd like, a, like to package up. We're going to call it a verifiable credential, and we're going to give it to you, the credential holder, or to someone who is a credential holder. When it comes time to share that, just like in the analog world that I talked about, you'll, in essence, take that digital credential out of your pocket on a, on a wallet type device and share it with someone who wants to receive that. We call those folks verifiers because they're going to receive the data and they're going to verify something. What are they going to verify? The things that I talked about. They're going to verify the data's authenticity and they're going to verify the data's integrity and they're going to do that using the ledger and the verifiable data registry. Um, we sort of use those words interchangeably, but they are rooted in Hyperledger ND. So they use the ledger to prove authenticity and integrity. The thing about these roles, issuers, holders, and verifiers, while we talk in simple terms often about use cases where let's say a DMV issues a driver's license credential to a holder who then shares it with uh, an airline, uh, the, the roles are not mutually exclusive. So we've created many, many use cases where an issuer will then consume their own credentials. Banking and financial services is a great example of this, where a bank may issue an account holder's credential to you and then allow you to present it back to them in order to prove who you are to transfer money around or get, gain access to your account or deposit or withdraw, all of which replaces usernames and passwords and all of which, when linked to your biometrics in a given wallet or device, has a far greater capacity to prove who you are than any 2FA or 3FA or password or text code sort of system that's going on. So issuers may consume their own credentials and be verifiers. Likewise, issuers can issue credentials to themselves and have others verify them. This is sort of the case of, of the farms that I talked about, the agricultural entities that are issuing themselves their own credentials and then allowing others to verify that, that um, farm data as, a, as proof of uh, it being authentic and, and having integrity. If, if anyone remembers a few years ago, uh, a German car maker had an issue with emissions data and, and fudging that and putting it in a spreadsheet, basically, instead of taking it straight from the automobiles. Uh, here's the case where the automobile could be a holder of its own data, right? So back to what we said, identity is everything. Um, and then present that credential to the government who's verifying its actual emissions. So the roles are not mutually exclusive here, but the workflow and the concept is the same throughout. So next week, Sam Curran, our chief architect, will talk at length about how we 
actually make all of this stuff work, but I'll give you a quick preview here. Um, and we use Hyperledger Indy, and we use something called Decentralized Identifiers, or DIDs. And DIDs, DIDs are gaining popularity in, in some culture, as you, you may hear about it on, in various platforms. Um, and it's important to, to make the distinction uh, about the DID and its relationship to um, this type of use case versus some other that, that Sean said is not really uh, part of the, the ecosystem here. It's not the NFTs. It's not the not the crypto uh, piece of it. This is using a blockchain technology and the decentralized identifiers that are written to a blockchain um, to build a relationship between two organizations, a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized relationship between a person and an issuer or a verifier and a holder. The DID is basically um, a blind address on the blockchain, and, and if you manage the cryptography properly and have the, the private key and the public key, you can go down to that uh, DID and unlock it, if you will, and, and see who controls it and who owns it, and therefore uh, understand who's on the other end of a transaction, which is the problem we identified at the beginning of this uh, presentation, identifying who you're dealing with, who's on the other side. In addition to writing a DID to the blockchain, we write a few other things. We write something called a schema. A schema is just a blank form. So if you if you read my slide closely here, you'll see that a schema written to a blockchain um, for let's say a driver's license um, has the attributes, last name, first name, date of birth, et cetera, et cetera. But we are not writing to the blockchain any actual personal information. We're just writing a blank form. This is a blank driver's license. It's a blank passport. It's a blank um, bachelor's degree credential schema. It, it's blank. That's the thing I want you to take away. We're not writing personal information to any ledger. Because for the ledger to be useful and functional and, and gain adoption and be truly decentralized, it needs to be readable by any entity that wants to read it. So we can't write things there. We can't write your personal information there. We don't want to, we shouldn't. Um, but we have to have some context and understanding of where your data point come from, comes from. So here's the schema thing. Think about the wallet that you carry around every day or your purse or your collection of, of things, credentials, physical credentials. The likelihood is that all of them have your name on them. And if I'm going to share my name in this decentralized identity way using the ledger and the, the, um, the verifiable credentials, it's important that the person receiving my name, verifying my name, understands the context of my name. In other words, if I'm going to rent a car, they need to know that my name came from a driver's license and not from my Starbucks card or not from my uh, ID at work or not from my debit card at the bank, right? So schemas are a list or blank form, but it provides context for those receiving it. We also write something called definitions, and that's maybe the most complicated thing to understand in all of this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But a definition is basically a restriction on the, the type of data that various entities might be able to access. And this helps um, aid in some of the privacy protections and, and autonomy and control that we want to um, create with this sort of technology. And lastly, and certainly not least, to, to lead into Sam's talk about uh, Hyperledger Indy, um, the ledger that underpins all of this and really makes it all work, the ledger that allows us to prove authenticity and, and help prove integrity of the data is based on Hyperledger uh, Indy. And so we build a network. There are a number of them out there, um, and DCO has four of them now for various uses um, with some nodes and node operators. And we have um, node operators, I think, on every continent except Antarctica to help support this geographically to, to help, um, of course, alleviate latency and other things that, that may be an issue. The nodes create the network and help support the ledger. On top of the ledger, we build some agents, and um, these agents are uh, another point of confusion sometimes in vocabulary, but agents are simply software programs that help do things for people. Um, every app on your phone is an agent of sorts that allows you to interact with some backend system. So we have um, decentralized identity agents that talk to the ledger and, um, and help manage all of this stuff, all of the writing to the ledger, all of the reading from the ledger. On top of those agents or along with them, <clears throat> oh boy, uh, and my, my uh, apologize, there we go. On top of the, the 
um, the ledger and the agents are some interfaces. So we can build a web interface, things can be hosted in the cloud and, um, and allow everybody to sort of communicate efficiently. We have something called the mediator that Sam will talk about next week. Um, the important part here is just to see the, the big picture architecture. And when we, we build all of that, we, we arrive at this endpoint where uh, everything is decentralized and no personal information is written to a ledger, but we now have the capability of providing the business value and the individual value for people of uh, proving things about themselves, about proving any given data points authenticity, proving any data points integrity, and uh, making systems very, very efficient by providing instantly actionable data. And all of this is done with um, Hyperledger's help and Hyperledger's code bases. And we use URSA as the cryptography library. We use uh, Indy and its associated um, plugins to manage the ledger piece of it. And then we use Hyperledger Aries um, as a basis to interact with the ledger and the, and the cryptography and provide an interface on the mobile side and, and a web type interface or, or various tools that, that build the agents that talk to all of this. And so that's where I'm going to leave off, and that's my, my end point here. Next is a technical overview of decentralized identity, where Sam Curran will come in and, and talk to you about all of the technical questions that you may have about how we make this work. And um, all of those are, are um, incredibly interesting, but hopefully today's session has helped you gain an understanding of why we have these things in the first place and where they bring value and how our... Um, how Hyperledger and, and the various companies that use it are, are using it to gain business value. And from there, I'll turn it back over to you, Sean. And thank you for your time today. Thanks everyone. Scott, thank you so much for that. We've got about 19 minutes left. Um, we do have questions starting in the chat. So I'm gonna read them out. Um, Ahad wants to know who's maintaining the Hyperledger Indie Network? Is it live? Can we create our own Indie Network? And I'll answer that question, yes. Ahad, um, Indicio is running four of their own networks. There's an organization called the Sovereign Foundation, which is running three or four indie networks in different stages. Um, but Hyperledger Indie is open source software. Anyone can take it and innovate with it on whatever their use case might be. Someone might use uh, Indie to build a network for um, all of the businesses in a state so that there is a business registry for a state. Someone else could use Indie to build a network for um, concert tickets. And, and, you know, you, you get a credential, which lets you access a concert, um, but it's open source software. Anyone can build and run with it. Um, AP, you asked, can we see a, a simple live demo? We do not have a did demo today. We may have one next week with Sam. Uh, Stephanie, this is a question for Scott. If no PII is written to the ledger, where is the PII stored? That, that's an excellent question. So uh, let me try to go up to a little slide here. Um, so the PII is stored in three places. Initially, it's stored with the issuer of a verifiable credential. So um, ostensibly, that issuer would have a, a right or a, um, um, a need for that data in their systems. And, and for simplicity's sake, we'll talk driver's license, right? So you've given, given that, that entity a bunch of your data. So it lives with them in their database, and they do the things that they do with it. And then when they create and issue the credential and package it up, um, they build, I should, let me, let me backtrack on this, the digital communication channel that happens between issuer and holder, and then holder and verifier, is a peer-to-peer -peer one. Um, and it's an encrypted um, channel that allows basically the holder's wallet device to talk directly to the issuer's agent um, up here, they, they speak directly to each other. And so in that encrypted channel, the data point, the PII moves from the issuer to the holder, and it's now held in a digital wallet. And that wallet can exist on your phone or it can exist in the cloud um, where your, your biometric device gives access to it, but it lives with the holder. And then at some point when the holder decides to share that, that credential and those PII data points with any given verifier, um, the consent happens and it, it happens along that same peer-to-peer -peer channel. So this is where we sort of uh, bring all the points together of understanding who's on each end of the transaction using DIDs, um, bringing governance into it to help uh, our visual agents, our software, tell you who's who that is by checking their DIDs and things and, and shares it with the verifier. So 
issuer has the data, holder has the data, the verifier gets the data, and then whether they keep it or store it is really up to them. And, and that's where we have some autonomy and transparency between holder and verifier to say, what are you doing with my data once you have it? Well, the, the reality is they probably do the same things they, they do anyway. If you were to send them a PDF or an Excel sheet or whatever, um, and retain it to, to meet their regulatory demands and their regulatory requirements. Cool. And again, if you join next week, Sam will give you much more information on the, the key management and how, how all that happens. But um, hopefully that answers the question. It lives at three points. Awesome. Uh, Alina asked the question, one, what is the database against which the identifying documents are checked and what jurisdictions are you currently operating in? Um, it can be, uh, to, to your first question, what database are they checked against? Um, that's maybe just a, a little bit of a, um, I want to use the right word here. You're just a little bit off and, and you're thinking about that. So they're not exactly checked against the database. Uh, what you're sort of, and forgive my, my assumption or inferences here, um, they're checked against the, the accuracy or the integrity and the authenticity is checked against the ledger, is not checked against the database. There is a governance assumption that the database that contains that that data is you know is um, is real, and that's that's really a governance question. So it can be any the data can be held in any sort of database in any form anywhere, but there's no callback. And importantly, and maybe I, I should have hit this a little bit harder, the verifier that receives the data never ever talk to the issuer about anything. They never go back and ping their database. They never go back and check anything. They use the ledger piece of it to check um, whether the credential is true and authentic. Hopefully that helps. What was the second part of the question, Sean? Uh, the second part of the question is, and, and Alina's got a follow up, what jurisdictions are you currently operating in? Um, do we by you? Do we mean Indicio? Indicio's customers, I'm, I'm our networks. I think your networks, yeah. Our, our networks, yeah. Our networks are, um, as I say, are our our node operators uh, who who support the networks are in, as I said, in every continent except Antarctica. So they're in they're in the EU. They're in South America, the Caribbean, um, Australia, through, throughout Asia. So we're, we're everywhere. Of course, cool. the U.S. and Canada. Uh, Alina's got to follow up because I, I still don't understand where the personal information sits at the issuer, the person, or the verifier. All three. So your data remains with everyone where you've submitted it to, but it's not on the blockchain ledger. I think there's a, a little bit of clarification that's needed there. Yeah, that, that it's exactly right. It, it, so if you think of decentralized identity as a model, a digital model of the analog world, if you go back to your physical driver's license, the DMV has your data. And they have a, a not only a right to your data, they have a regulatory need to retain your data. Or let's let's talk about a bank perhaps, right? They have a regulatory requirement to retain your personal information as part of their KYC and AML processes. So it has to live there, it has to stay at the issuer. But if the bank gives you a verifiable credential, uh, says, hey, I own an account here, they're going to pass some of that personal information to you, your account number and things like that, and you're going to hold it in your digital wallet. And then if you're going to, let's say, share that with another bank to open another account so that bank B doesn't have to go through all those KYC processes, they're going to retain that data as well because they have a regulatory requirement to do so. Um, so part of the work that we do, or I do, and, and Sam does with our clients and customers is, is asking those exact questions. Um, the data has to be at the issuer's side because a credential has to be created in the first place. Um, it has to be with the holder because they're the ones who have the autonomy and decentralized control to obtain consent and transparency. Whether the verifier retains it is up to um, the regulatory environment that they exist in. Do they have to retain it? Do they want to retain it? Is data a liability or an asset for them? Um, so, so that's the long-winded answer to that somewhat simple question. No, that's awesome. And, I, and I've used, Alina, the example in the past of renting an apartment. 
Um, Mm -hmm. Landlord wants to see proof that you have a bank account or proof that you are a customer of like a utility company, but you don't want to necessarily give them your bank statement. You could give them a verifiable credential from the bank saying you've got an account there. You've been a customer for X number of years and you have a balance over X and that's more than enough if 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 the landlord trusts that bank that they don't need to see a copy of your bank statement and do who knows what with it. Um, jumping on to the next couple of questions, Bert asked, well, David Stark asked, why Hyperledger Indie versus Fabric? Um, I will jump on that question. Uh, David, thank you. Indie is purpose-built for identity. I don't think a, a normal person would try to use Indie to do a supply chain um, application, whereas Hyperledger Fabric is has a lot of different utility. Fabric could be used for supply chain. There has been uh, there have been a couple of POCs in the past where people used Indie as the identity layer on a Fabric network. Fabric already has Fabric CA, the certificate authority. Um, so you you would you would use Indie if your use case was specific to identity or verifiable credentials, and you wanted something that could quickly get you into that space. Uh, Bert asked, "What are the benefits of blockchain ledgers versus ledgers using self sovereign identity technologies?" BERT, Hyperledger, Indy, Aries, and Ursa are self-sovereign identity technologies. They were they were designed for this purpose. Um, there are lots of folks doing self-sovereign identity, and some of them are using other tools. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. You know, like the Decentralized Identity Foundation has folks using Indy, has folks using Cosmos, uh, folks using um, Ion and sidechains. Um, Scott, this one's for you. Is Indy the only option for identity? What's the difference between each layer? That's from Kartik. Uh, well, as you said, it's not the only option for identity, and and we, in fact, at Indicio, while, while we maintain or or help administer, of course, the decentralized uh, ND network um, and the, the associated ledgers, uh, we have customers that have built use cases and solutions and used our our, our tools on other uh, on other things on Ion on on. And we have one now scoping out an entirely different methodology. So. Um, Maybe that answers the question. It, it can it can be be configured and architected any number of ways. And, and to add to your last answer, um, you know, there we have explored and, and built a number of use cases where um, fabric or, or certain supply chain um, things ha- have a need for an identity layer on top of them. And you, I don't want to overlook that that there's a, there's a an opportunity here to to add identity to things that don't currently have it um in order to enable some of the privacy protections that, that you described and you know protecting your privacy with the landlord is one thing but there are businesses that need to protect uh private and sensitive information and, and proprietary information and things like that that um this gives them the ability to do as well awesome uh what this is from uh Benga, what are the challenges of decentralized identity applications gaining mass adoption? Um, the, in my mind, the primary blocker is, um, well, there are two. One is simply education and understanding what this is. And it's a huge piece of the effort that we we put into our business model at Indicio. And, and I know Hyperledger does as well in engaging with us and others to do these, these types of things because um, our experience has been um, a few hours of, of understanding why it needs to exist, what it is, and then how we do it um, leads to very quick, um, you know, jump in the jump in the water with us and build these use cases. So it's just new, and that's one of the things. Um, and I, I'm going to retract my statement of two things. It's three things. Um, the second is governance, and governance can be very, very complicated, and be a block for to adoption. And it has been in the past. So when we when we and others were attempting to use this sort of um, self sovereign identity technology around COVID solutions. Uh, there were others that tried to create a, a governance policy that that you know built into the technology all of the various needs and regulatory requirements of of a dozen different countries and a, and many many different health organizations and and border control and and all sorts of things right? I won't even get into how deep it went uh, and it never got off the ground because we were trying or I shouldn't say we others were trying to solve for all of that at once. And governance can be very, very complicated because every every participant has their own needs and their own requirements, and it all needs to come together in some software that that you know provides that functionality. 
Um, so our approach to governance is a decentralized one and where we say, hey, here's party A and here's party B and you wanna share data, let's work out governance for the two of you. And then somebody else is going to come to play and say, let's add in my little piece and my little piece and so forth. And that's where we've, we've driven adoption is, is through simplifying governance, right? Um, and then and the third is really about um, about the the legacy systems that this supplants and and it's a, a sunk cost model for a lot of enterprises and governments and the US government is a great one where they've sunk a ton of money into things like IDME and some other um, more centralized or federated identity providers um, in order to validate certain things. And, and we've said, well, you don't need that. You're issuing credentials anyway, government. Um, just issue them straight to your people and have them present them back in my, my uh, you know, roles thing. You don't need this intermediary. But those intermediaries are um, pretty well entrenched. And, and uh, interestingly, those intermediaries are coming around to the idea that they're about to be supplanted and they need to move on to this. So it's just, just that it's early stage and there's you know entrenched ideas and entrenched technology that needs to be supplanted. Um, Sam Reed to ask, are there references for using Aries Indy as a system to authenticate transactions done in Fabric? Scott, if you've got any examples or white papers, if you want to send them to me, I'll put them in the notes uh, afterwards. Um, Wilson asked, how does this compare to an SSI, self-sovereign identity? Indian Aries and URSA are um, foundational components of one solution to self-sovereign identity. Um, there, there are a lot out there, but de decentralized identifiers are, are kind of the root of all that. Um, yeah. I'll add, Sean, that, that um, we... <laughs> Self-sovereign identity is is sort of a legacy term. It's still used, uh, clearly, uh, but from a from adoption point of view, to to go back to adoption, it proved to be a blocker for us. Um, it proved to be a blocker for a lot because the let's be honest, who's buying this stuff and who's paying for it? It's enterprise and right. and it's governments and the idea. <laughs> Uh, even though it's the right ethical idea of ceding sovereign control to others um, is, is the proper thing to do, let's say, um, it's it's just a word that was a blocker to go, well, we're a government, we're the sovereign entity here, not not individuals. Um, so, so SSI and decentralized identity can be used interchangeably. And the goal of this presentation is is actually when I when I do it for others, we start with that SSI term and say, okay, this is this is what we mean. Um, by SSI. What we really mean is it's decentralized identity. And what we really mean by identity is it's just data. And what we really mean by decentralized is, is autonomy and control at the endpoints. So, so they are largely one and the same conceptually. Cool. Um, Ramesh asked, how about scalability issues and benchmarking? So some of the scalability issues or, or the major scalability issue <laughs> centers around um, the this thing here called a mediator agent. And if you look at some of the efforts in decentralized identity, uh, a European or the German driver's license is one that did not do well. Um, it's focused around a mediator agent. Sam will talk about mediators next week, but it's essentially a, a cloud-based encrypted escrow for these edge agents that, that come and go offline in airplane mode and power off and things like that. Um, so being able to scale that mediator to handle a lot of uh, devices and handle a lot of things has been, been um, you know, one of the scaling challenges. The, the thing that's not a challenge is that the, there are not a ton of ledger transactions that have to happen. In fact, they're very, very few. It's almost blockchain light. And in that sense, it's very, very green and very, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's not green, but it's greener than other blockchains by quite a bit. In the sense that when you write a single did to, um, to the ledger and you write a single schema and you write a definition, that's all you have to do to issue millions of credentials. For three, maybe four ledger writes, and you can issue millions of credentials because you're not writing PII to the ledger for each and every credential. You're simply writing a reference to, to the things that are on the ledger to prove authenticity and, and integrity. So um, when it comes to scalability, 
Um, the ledger itself and Hyperledger ND is not a, a blocker at all. It's some of the tools built on top of that to facilitate it, like these mediator agents that um, that are not a Hyperledger thing. They're they're more of a um, you know commercial thing. Absolutely. And if you think about it, how often do you get a new driver's license versus how many times do you show a driver's license in a week? Right. You live in New York City, you're showing a driver's license to get into most commercial buildings, and you're going to use it when you go to the bank. Whereas you, you get a driver's license in the state of New York like once every four or five years. Um, yeah. AP asked, is a Hyperledger Indy did better than a better choice than an Ethereum based did? I'm going to jump on that one. Um, you as a user, AP, in the future will have multiple dids in your wallet from multiple different chains and providers and issuers. And you're going to have some that are Ethereum based and some are indie based and some are Cosmos based, and they should all be on your terms and your, you shouldn't have to have a wallet for each one. Um, and that's where the community is going. Yep. Even within okay. the context of Piper Ledger Indie, you, you have multiple dids. You don't really see it, but, but you do, you have one, you know, a unique did to transact with each, each entity that you transact with. Uh, because that's the did to did peer to peer did com piece of yeah. this, right? So we 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 want interoperability in, into everything. So I would say one is not better than the other. It's it's what your your use case is. Why would you do something in Ethereum versus Indy? Depends on on what you're trying to build. I'm gonna see if I can get another question before we go. Um, thanks to everyone in the chat who's who's helping with Alina's question uh, specifically, Trevor. Um, all right, last question. This is a good one from Zachy. What happens if you lose your digital wallet? How would you recover um, the private keys to create the wallet? Okay, two two quick answers on that um, that are very simplistic. And if you join next week, Sam will give you the details, uh, detailed answers. Uh, if you're using what we would call a cloud hosted custodial type wallet, where your your device, let's say, actually just taps into a backend um, encrypted system, then you just get your new device and and um, and get get into that with with let's say typical means um you can authenticate a number of different ways uh that that's less likely to be the case but going back to to what i said decentralized identity is a digital model of the analog world what happens when you lose your wallet well you go back to the dmv and you show up and you prove who you are and you get your credential and you go back to the bank and you say hey i need a new debit card and all those sorts of things so you really just re-authenticate yourself into a new wallet and go back and get those credentials reissued to you the difference in in this form format versus walking into the dmv and showing all your documents is that you can using the same methods you did before prove yourself or authenticate yourself um at a distance and just sit on on the various websites and and uh perhaps scan a qr code and to get reissued your credentials depending on the regulatory environment and the workflow that that issuer want, wanted to create for you so you you do the same thing you do as if you lose your physical wallet go back and get re-get all your stuff and Unfortunately, that is the last question we're going to be able to ask. Jamie R., I just put the uh, link uh, to all of our links in the chat. Um, also, someone asked a question about Hyperledger Fabric and Cloud. This is about Indy. Uh, Fabric is still a fantastic project inside of Hyperledger, and there are a ton of people working on it. Um, Scott, thank you so much for such a great presentation. I'd like to also thank all the attendees for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, and next... Tuesday at 12 noon, we are going to have Sam Curran give a technical underpinnings of um, decentralized identity, which is the, the second half of this, this process. And that will be brought to you by uh, Morgan State, as well as Indicio and Hyperledger. And I'd like to thank everyone once again. Um, I'm going to post the video to YouTube. I want to trim out the, the, the beginning and the end, but get that posted. And um, that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great Have a great day. Thanks all. Bye-bye.